Thank you very much uh, for the invitation and, um, and for today, Guywa, for putting it on. And welcome, everybody, and also welcome for the, to those people who have joined us online. Now, Sadiq, I must say, I felt like you took me down a trip on memory lane there. And Kerry, I sort of resonated with you when you had the photo of 2003 in Lentils. I think I would have about the same one, but I don't know whether you did the work on Narbon Beans research, where I did that, I think I worked on your project on the East for you. So, a bit of history here. It shows my age. Anyway, moving on. So again, this is a great forum, and I'm really pleased and really excited that uh, that Giwa has put this on, and it's, and pulses do add value to our cropping systems. So I'm going to give you a bit of a presentation on the market drivers and the impediments of the Australian pulses. Let's see. So firstly, for my presentation, I'm going to give you a. Uh, talk a little bit about AGIC. We'll talk about the fit of pulses in the Australian grain production system. We'll look at current and future market drivers. We'll talk a little bit about each pulse crop and then a few final key messages and then handing over to John. So just moving on. So for um, those that, uh, a lot of the people in the room here are very familiar who AGIC is and we've got people joining online. So AGIC is the Australian Export Grains Innovation Centre. We're an independent non-for-profit company. We're funded by the Australian Government, and which is the Western Australian Government here, and also the Australian Grain Growers, so GRDC. We do a lot of work with DPIRT, so we've got some really good, strong investments for AGIC. Um, we were established in 2012 to increase the value of the Australian grain, and that's here at a national level, but also at an international level to our customers who purchase our grain. And we do that through technical market engagement. We're a national organisation, so we have a we and we are in that technical space. So we have labs here in Perth and also over in Sydney. And in those labs, we have pilot milling, we have bakeries, and we have um, technical uh, innovation research centres there. Not only with AGIC, we uh, have our technical space, we have the economic space, we have our market insights area, and I work in that market insights area. Okay, so moving into the presentation, when we look at how pulses fit into the Australian grain production system, and I know a lot of you will be already familiar with that because you're here in, pol in the here here and very passionate about pulses. So just to put a picture of pulses in the Australian grains industry, um, I've got a graph up here about our production. So over the, the long period, Australia plan around 22 million hectares of commercial grain crop per year. This year, I think we're in for a bumper year where we're growing around 23 million hectares of commercial grain crop. We grow less than a million hectares of summer crops. Um, and we have, um, and so my presentation is going to be a, a, around the pulses within our, our commercial grain crop. What does it look like, um, our production of 22 million hectares? Um, over the five year average, Australia grows around 47 million metric tonnes. Of that production, pulses represented by 6%. So we're the fourth biggest uh, grain crop in, uh, in Australia. So clearly what Kip, uh, Sadiq said, where wheat and barley are the major crops, canola, but pulses, which combine a field peas, favour beans, lentils, chickpeas and lupins represent 6% of the total production area. When we look at what's been sown over the last 10 years, I've got um, up here a slide of chickpeas, lentils, field peas and favour beans. You can see that um, we still produce just under a million hectares of, uh, of lupins. Um, you see that, that we have a declining growth in field peas. Um, and that declining growth has been taken up by lentils where we see there's been an increase in lentil production. And one of the drivers for that is around price and around innovation and technology. Um, you can see that favour beans have been a consistently been produced across Australia, not only for the last 10 years, but I'd say around the last 25 to 30 years where we produce around um, 220,000 to 240,000 tonnes per annum. Um, and we can see that uh, chickpeas is our biggest uh, one has has taken up area when we were at, had market access to China and as what Sadiq said, as soon as we lost market access to China, our production went down. But that just gives you a bit of a schematic of what pulses are being grown across Australia. When we look at actually what uh, the world is producing in pulses, up here I've got a, uh, an image and India is the largest uh, producer of pulses. Over the last 10 years, it produces a, just on average around 21 million hectares, um, million tonnes, sorry. 
followed by Canada and a big drop off to China as well. So Australia, even though we're around that 2.5 to 2 point to 3 million tonnes, we're not as big as what India um, produces. Very fortunate in this slide that we actually market to eight of the countries in, in um, no, actually it's the next slide. When we look at actually who's importing pulses, even though India produce around 21 million tonnes, they actually still import pulses around 3 million tonnes. China and Bangladesh. So it's a fairly concentrated area of where the markets are. Um, we're very fortunate here that Australia uh, do supply to, out of the top 10, we supply eight of those markets. So the market drivers and impediments of pulses in of Australian pulses. So when we look at what the drivers are, recapping, um, we know that pulses add value, ag agronomic value, nutritional value to your soil types. We know that um, a driver in pulse production is also price, because it is very attractive. You saw in 2015, 16, where lentils went from $400 a tonne up to $1,200 a tonne, and we had farmers in South Australia growing lentils are three times in a row, um, back to back to back. So we know price is an attractive um, driver. We look at um, also driving, Ross Kingwell's ca carrying out of a study um, that looks at the supply chain infrastructure and storage, and we've, we know with impro improved supply chain infrastructure and storage, there is a greater use of pulses in those feed markets because they have access to them. We have increased animal feed production and um, and a driver for Australia is also around the manufacturing of protein concentrate isolates. So we have three of those manufacturing um, businesses that have set up across Australia. In Horsham, they've got the Phil P1, uh, the Faber Bean one, you've got one in South Australia looking at lentils. They're, they they add value to the Australian grains industry because if we've got grade two and grade three pulses that don't get premium price on the export market, they do take up a smaller percentage of our grain. So that adds value to the grower, they have market diversity, and that's what we're after. We're after market and supply diversity so that the farmer does have a supply chain and a path to market. Um, what are our impediments? So on the flip, as much as pulses are really good for our production systems, they can also be very challenging as well. They don't all have agronomic fit across all soil types and all, and all climatic conditions. Impediment, um, sometimes the domestic price isn't that attractive, like if you're looking at uh, growing at favour beans, I think, favor, uh, and um, other pulses, sometimes it costs you more to put into growing to the crop than what you would get out. So that can work against us as well. Um, and then also in some regions, you actually can make more money out of, in, in some years, make more money out of other crops compared to pulses but I'm very passionate about pulses and I know that there's a lot of farmers in, in the 80s and the 90s that made a lot of money out of pulses and still are to this day. Um, so what are the global drivers and impediments for pulses? Well, if we look at population growth, as the growth increases, their consumption increases um, and they, everybody will require a level of protein. If you can't get it through meat, you'll get it through other sources, um, such as our primary pulses, the lentils, chickpeas, field peas and favour beans. What else is another driver to pulses is pulses being sold into, well, it comes from affluency um, and pulses being sold into the feed market, into the meat markets that are used for, that then comes on our kitchen table in terms of beef, pork and fish. So that's driving our um, growth of pulse. Uh, again, you look at that pulse protein concentration and isolate development that we're doing here in Australia, we know that China is massive in that area. Um, corporate responsibility and sustainability around production. Australia, our grain farmers are some of the best growers are, and are consciously aware around sustainability and we lead in innovation and technology. Um, and then you've got that emotional um, consumption of eating pulses where people want to uh, eat natural products compared to GMO product food. So, so pulses do have a fit in, the, in that space. Um, what are our impediments? Um, as much as we are a big producer and a niche producer, we also are a small producer compared to other, um, uh, to, compared to some of our competitors such as China and, uh, and Canada. Um, what's also an impediment now, and I think John will know a lot about this, it's around the freight cross. So at the moment, uh, pulses, 
I think getting containers to export pulses costs more than the actual the product that's going into the containers and whether that's going to change over the next 12 months, who knows, but that's a, an impediment at the moment. Um, you've got increased production of exporters' com competitors. So you just look at Canada. Canada went from uh, zero to around two million tonnes of uh, yellow field peas to export into China. So they've got that big market gap. Um, they've got the ability to increase their pulse production where we sort of are challenged into that to do that. Um, you look at trade market access constraints. So uh, tariffs play a big impediment into the Australian pulse production. So when production's going great in some countries, they um, will put down a tariff. When the production is going pretty bad, they will remove the tariff. So that does play, as you all are very familiar with, plays into the production and consistency of growing pulses in Australia. Um, as I've talked about before, income growth change and, and changing food consumption patterns where we'll, we'll has some impact into our pulse uh, markets. And then Australia, where we could uh, do better, um, and improve is our engagement at a global level. If you look at Canada, Canada have the Canadian Pulse uh, Council, but they also have within Alberta the, the Alberta Pulse Council, and they are uh, they have a lot more financial assistance to do the technical market engagement and promoting themselves in front of our customers. Um, so some of these are obstacles that we can overcome. Um, now, if we look at an overview of pulses by type. So I've just got up a slide here of field peas um, and where they are grown across, across, across the world. We know the production of field peas is around 14 to 15 million metric tonnes. And you look at what um, Australia produce on average between 200 to 400,000 tonnes. So we do, the ability of Australia, we do export our field peas into niche markets. So that's a, an advantage of the Australian pulse industry compared to some of our other competitors. Um, we do have, um, we do also have growth in limited markets. Uh, globally, most of our growth is in the field pea trade will occur in that feed space. That's where you can see some of our our increased market space, our increased opportunities will be in the feed space. Um, and then Canada and Russia are best placed to take advantage of market growth, so they are large producers of pulses. When we look at it, favour beans, so favour beans here in Australia, the new opportunities are ahead. We're heavily relying on one market for this product. So if we have market diversity around faba beans, I dare say you'll see more faba beans in production because you've got, um, because it can be very profitable at the farm level, it will increase your, um, it does add value when you put them into a cropping rotation, but if you can't make money out of it, you can see that it still has that balance around 200 to 400,000 tonnes being produced annually. Um, the growing interest in protein isolates is very uh, attractive for faba beans. And uh, you can see where I think the biggest uh, opportunities for the Australian farmer and faba beans is into China. They have three, they have four markets where we can see growth. That is into the food market for snacks, feed, protein isolates, but also the aquaculture industry in China um, is very, profitable and very favourable to, towards faba beans. So what they're doing in China, they're buying, they have bought our faba beans before, they soak them up and then they put them into the fish ponds and then the fish have an alternative food protein source for production of fish. So that market is absolutely growing, not only in China, but also in Southeast Asia. A lot of AGIX technical market engagement work we've done around feed space. We're always getting feedback that can you look at faba beans in the aquaculture space because it's profitable for them. And then, then, and then down for us as the Australian grains industry provides alternative market sources. There is opportunities, um, but small opportunities for uh, faba beans into uh, India, used for splitting and for flour. Um, when we look at lentils, we need a diverse customer base. We're fairly highly concentrated on one market, and that would be India. So um, coming up, uh, you would have seen this year, the Modi government and, and Morrison at the time, they are developing an India-Australian comprehensive economic agreement cooperation agreement. Um, so this is hopefully going to um, 
work to resolving some of those trade market access issues and also provide the opportunity for Australia to increase our, um, our, 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 all our grains into India. Um, with lentils, there is uh, limited, uh, or limited growth for, um, there's slow growth in that food market, however. When we look at chickpeas, as Sadiq said, we have both the Desis and the Kabuli chickpeas, and we are again highly reliant on one market. We do export to um, Desis to Pakistan, Bangladesh, and the United Arab Emirates. Around 30,000 tonnes of Australian chickpeas are, are used as chana dal and, and um, exported to the expatriate countries, such as expatriate countries for consumption. Australian production has declined since the imposition of the Indian tariff on lentils, so market access is vital. Um, lupins, there's a lot of enthusiasm in lupins. It's great to see the investment deep are doing into lupins. Um, there's, there, there is growth in that food, food area of lupins. Um, we have new and additional food safety information could make our markets more buoyant for lupins. Um, you're looking at that manufacturing and protein concentration isolation ha isolates has commenced, so that's got growth in there. There is feed opportunity in Southeast Asia for our lupins and the AGIC with um, support from the Australian government are doing a lot of work to promote lupins in food spa in feed, spa feed markets. And uh, the Middle East remains the important market for Albus lupins. So just in summary, because I've uh, whizzed through this presentation, Australia is relatively a small producer of most, most pulses, but that is actually um, adds value to us. Um, we have diversity in our pulse production and can supply those niche markets. Um, we do receive substantial competition from the big producers of pulses, be that Canada and the Black Sea. We have uncertain growth opportunities in traditional food markets. So again, feed is, is, feed is where we're going to get some of our biggest uptake of pulses. Trade market access is becoming increasingly important to, um, to our production and to uh, our growers and the growth will be in new foods and feed supplies. Um, where I hope we can see investment is into that technical, technical engagement to help support and prime customers of Australian grains to use more products of pulses. So um, I'd just like to thank everybody, but also um, let, let you know that this work that uh, AGIC's doing in the pulse space is with uh, Barry Cox and also Pete White. Some, and I think that you had a photo of Pete White up there, Sadiq. And I know, Kerry, you've worked a lot with Pete White. So the, the team in AGIC are very passionate with pulses. We're actually very fortunate to receive funding from the Australian government, the Australian Trade Market Access Corporation, to facilitate a pulse opportunities pilot. Um, so what that Pulse Opportunities pilot is around building market opportunities indexes across all our Pulse crops and using it as a database and producing information and reports that will be available to the Australian Pulse industry. And all these products should be available to um, the Australian grains industry by the end of 2022. So thank you very much and I'll hand over to you, John. G'day Mary, Mark Seymour from Deep Herd. Um, wondering Indonesia, where do they fit in terms of a potential market for any and all of our pulses? We, um, so yeah. feed space, we're seeing a big growth in the feed space for our pulses. Um, we've really been promoting lupins into Indonesia. You will see faba beans, um, we'll go into Indonesia again in that high, high end aqua area has great opportunities as well for our, our pulses there. We're not seeing, uh, haven't seen much growth in terms of lentils into Indonesia, but definitely it's around that feed, feed area, feed market. Uh, so you say uh, you're going to introduce uh, Lupin to Indonesia, so what kind of things, Lupin product you introduce to Indonesia, like, uh, you know, as a stock feed or a human food or something? It'll be for stock feed, so it'll be in the milling areas, um, yeah, for the stock feed nutritional components. Yeah, uh, uh, good talk there, Mary. I'm Tony Swan from uh, CSIRO in Canberra. Um, and uh, a good talk from Sadiq as well. Um, it's uh, my first visit to WA. So um, I'm just, um, I've been in, uh, working in the 
in the pulse industry and systems for a fair while now. And just um, from the farmers I work with, um, a lot of them, well, and you, you raised it, you, you only said 6% of, of pulses in Australia. Now, if you look at the systems, that's just not enough to, for the nitrogen fixation and to, for the sustainability of the industry. But most of the farmers I, I work with are, are very, you know, they're, they're good people. They will, um, you know, they've got to make money. But we're looking at global volatility of prices is a huge deterrent. The hassles of actually trying to sell um, pulses in Australia off the farm. You know, a lot of these guys are just saying, okay, we grew our two or three or four tonne chickpea crop, but it was over in the West in the wet, in wet times. But the hassles were enormous and just we don't have a, we, we can't get rid of them. You know, um, we want a system, something like canola or wheat, where we can, where we can do that. Mm. And, and the management issues. So, you know, the packages are coming out. What Sadiq came up with, you know, saying, okay, these are the, you know, these are the areas where you should be growing different crops was fantastic. You know, you, you don't need to reinvent the wheel there, but more research targeted. But it's the farmers saying, okay, I, I want a, a whole package from, you know, which is easy. And um, pulses aren't as easy to grow, especially in wet weather. Um, Very capricious. And, and, the, and the global environment. So I, I'm just, yeah, where do we go there um, in, in the global in uh, the global case. space, yeah, and just trying to make market. So you know, you know, the, the money is there to come back and and, and really get that you know move it from six percent to to twenty percent, which uh, is what you need. True. So um, I think we're going to have the biggest growth opportunities for Australian pulses in that feed space area. So an alternative feed space. What we need to do in that area is do the technical market engagement to prime those countries. So. We, we know that Southeast Asia are very familiar about soy and, and corn products. They're getting a lot of engagement from um, the US. They're very much at the market face there. We know that Canada's doing a lot of engagement in, in that space. So you, you actually need, well, I think we need to brand our products, how to extract full value out of it, and, and then how to actually educate them and use, uh, edu how to ed educate them to how they can use it in their feeding systems because that primary knowledge is not there. They, they don't know which mills to use, they don't know how to store it, they don't know when to incorporate it and what time to use the feed, like what time do you incorporate into the feeding rations to, if in the dairy cows to maintain lactation, if it's in the pig industry uh, after they've given birth, like there are different supplements. So we just need to do that branding, I would say, and, and and it's supporting our commercial trade. That's where I can see we're going to get the biggest growth. I was just going to say, but we really need to get more into the human market and get the volatility and the price right in that market. Um, you know, so if we can put more chickpeas or, or lentils, or if, if you know, uh, lupins are able to get into the human market, fantastic. Yeah. Um, especially in a world where potentially more people are are going into uh, eat, eating grain and, and less meat, um, poor souls. But um, yeah, just yeah, the human market or, or just the higher value market, we've, we've got to go there just to promote it for farmers to say, yes, just I'm hold, going to put the effort. Just hold that thought because there will be more. Totally of that agree. Today. Yeah, yeah. The, there is growth in the human um, consumption and there's big growth in that high value aquaculture and then there's growth in the feed. I've got a question from May Connolly, who's online, from Fomenko. Uh, in the sh is there a short-term opportunity for us to do some market development work uh, targeting markets that usually source pulses from Russia and the Ukraine? Um, good question, May. I think AGIC get asked to do a lot of technical and market engagement activities, but uh, am I allowed to say... Um, that we do require resources to do that. But it, it, there is the opportunity there because we know that they're major producers and major exporters and we're going to be short of that grain this year. So there, there will be the opportunity. It will dare come. Yes. Thank you, Mary. Who does it? I'm not quite sure. Thank you.